Hello, this is Dr. Anju Singh doing a voiceover for exercise 14, skeletal muscle and their action from the Anatomy and Physiology Lab Manual by um, Harper and Allen, 6th edition for uh, Biology 121 AP1 class. All right, so to start with, first of all, um, the action of a muscle is determined basically by its location and a muscle is attached at two points called the origin and the insertion. Uh, the non-moving part of the muscle is called the origin and the movable component of the muscle is known as the insertion. So when a muscle contracts, it's the insertion that moves towards the origin. Usually the origin is proximal and the insertion is distal. And when the muscle contracts, it brings the distal part closer to the proximal part of the body. Um, and the enlarged area of the muscle between the origin and the insertion is known as the belly of the muscle. Uh, certain muscles, like the facial muscles, they, may, they have the origin in the uh, facial bones, and the insertion is usually on the undersurface of the skin of the face, which helps us make all the facial expressions um, to express emotion. Muscles can also be uh, divided uh, based on their uh, location, their depth, and their function. So when a group of muscles that have similar function and they're all surrounded by a fascia, uh, they form a compartment. And that is sometimes important because we have conditions called compartment syndrome um, because it affects all the muscles in that compartment. Uh, muscles that are just below the skin are usually called superficial muscles, and then there is a deeper layer of muscles known as the deep muscles. Um, muscles that are um, a, a large group of muscles in which uh, one larger muscle in that group is the prime mover, that muscle is known as the agonistic muscle. And a smaller muscle in the same group that assists the agonistic muscle is known as the synergistic muscle. So I need you to get accustomed with these names. All right, a group of muscles that um, um, the muscle, uh, a group of muscles that carry on the same action, the larger muscle, that is your agonistic muscle, and all the other smaller muscles that do the same action and, and assist the agonistic muscles. Uh, muscle that is the synergist muscle. A group of muscles that performs an opposing movement is known as an antagonistic muscle. So for example, um, muscles on the anterior surface of the arm would be the flexor muscles. The muscles on the posterior surface of the arm would be the extensor muscles. Uh, the, the extensors are agonistic to the flexors and vice versa, the flexors are antagonist to the extensors. Okay, fixators are muscles that stabilize the point of origin. All right, so I need you to be accustomed with these words because once you understand that, you'll be able to understand the function of these muscles. Um, so basically, the muscles are all named based on their location, the distribution of the direction of their fibers, the structure where they're attached, or the function that they do. So what I want you to do here is in lab activity one on page 200, um, I want you to look at these different names, you know, go through the table 14.1 uh, on page 200 and on page 201, and get an idea of um, how a muscle is named um, all these definitions uh, based on their direction, based on their size, based on their shape, based on their principal action, based on, you know, the number of heads, the number of tendons or origin that the muscle have, and um, examples of these muscles, and then do this exercise in lab activity one, where they've given you the first example, like the orbicularis oris. Orbicularis, the word orbicularis means direction of the fibers, they are circular. So they make like an orbit. Uh, and oculi means around the eye. So the minute you hear the word orbicularis oculi, the name tells you it's the circular muscle around the eye, which becomes so easy to identify. And as you can see in this figure, orbicularis um, oculi is labeled number two in this figure. All right. 
Um, so go through the rest of the muscles like the biceps brachii, rectus femoris, gluteus maximus, deltoid, all of these. And I want you to tell me, you know, they have two components. Each name has at least two components. Tell me what those both, both those components are. OK, so that's part of your homework for this. Um, spend some time learning all these muscle criteria, naming criteria of in table 14.1 and then answer that question in lab activity one. So moving on to the muscles uh, of the head and neck and the face. So first here we have figure 14.1 showing you the superficial uh, layer of muscles of the head and neck. Um, so the right on the left side they've already given you the name and you kind of sort of have to just redo it on the right side. So number one is your frontalis muscle. It's also known as the fronto um, uh, uh, occipito frontalis muscle because it goes all the way from the occipital bone at the back to the frontal bone in the front, except it has an eponeurosis on the top. You see that epicranial eponeurosis on top? Um, that's all basically one muscle which has so to speak two bellies so the frontalis is the frontal belly of the occipital frontalis muscle number two here in this figure is orbicularis oculi number three is the zygomaticus major number four is the zygomaticus minor number five is, is um, orbicularis oris so that's a circular muscle around the mouth. And number six is the platysma. Um, and I want you to be able to know how, you know, how these muscles contract. So I'd like you to spend some time contracting these muscles on your own body and knowing the distinction between, um, for example, say the platysma and the sternocleidomastoid. And we'll see that in a minute. Sternocleidomastoid is just below. And I can show you in this figure right here this would be the sternocleidomastoid muscle and you see how it's below the platysma this is the platysma right here okay so the platysma is superficial and the sternocleidomastoid muscle is going under the platysma here and it goes all the way under the surface and it's called sternocleidomastoid because it runs diagonally from the sternum and the clavicle to the mastoid process of the temporal bone and that's why it's called the sternocleidomastoid muscle, all right? So once you understand the names of these muscles, it'll really make it easy for you to know, number one, where the muscle is located, and number two, um, to help you remember what the muscle does, all right? Um, just going over all the other names of this, um, we did the epicranial uh, epineurosis, frontalis, orbicularis oculi, nasalis muscle, um, helps to elevate the nose. You have the levator labii superioris, as the name says, it elevates the lips. Zygomaticus uh, major and zygomaticus minor, these are uh, uh, muscles uh, primarily used when we smile. Then we have the uh, risorius, the orbicularis oris. So when you say the, the letter O, the muscle you're using is orbicularis oculi. Then you have the um, depressor labi inferioris, which helps you depress your lower lip. Yeah. Depressor anguli oris. This is the muscle that contracts and gives you the sad face emojis because it pulls the angles of the mouth. Depress depressor anguli, all right? So it depresses the angles of the mouth. Depressor anguli oris, all right? And the mentalis muscle, uh, that's right there on the tip of the mandible, all right? Uh, figure 14.1b uh, shows the superficial view of these um, muscles of the face and this is on a dissected body the previous uh, figure was more on a model so here you see the um, epicranial eponeurosis on the top of the cranium the frontalis belly of the occipital frontalis muscle the orbicularis or oculi muscle and again this is a very very superficial dissection so just the skin has been very gently peeled off if you will because these muscles attach to the undersurface of the skin um, you have the levator labi superioris the 
uh, orbicularis oris, the platysma. You're able to see the thyroid cartilage. Now remember, the thyroid cartilage is very um, superficial. It's just below the skin. Um, the zygomaticus major and zygomaticus minor muscles that are involved in smiling, depressor anguli oris, the thyrohyoid, sternocleidomastoid, and trapezius. These are your deeper muscles. You see on the right side, the platysma has been dissected off. All right, the platysma has been removed on the right side. On the left side, you're able to see the platysma. It is a superficial muscle. And once you remove the platysma under the platysma, you're able to see the thyrohyoid, um, sternocleidomastoid, and the trapezius muscle. So now we are at figure 14.2. Uh, this is showing the uh, lateral view of the head and selected muscles in the lateral view. So what we're seeing here, you're able to see the occipital frontalis muscle now, how it's going continuously from the occipital bone of the skull over the um, cranium to the front. And you're able to see the uh, cranial eponeurosis, epicranial eponeurosis, the occipitalis belly at posteriorly and the frontalis belly anteriorly. Um, and the three groups of uh, muscles, um, well, uh, the group of muscles, the circular muscle around the eye is the orbicularis oculi. Uh, you can see the zygomaticus major and minor muscle, how they uh, attach to the zygomatic process. Um, uh, the buccinator muscle. The buccinator muscle is the muscle that helps you puff up. So when you fill your mouth with air, um, that's your buccinator muscle. Um, so like when you're blowing a balloon, you're using a buccinator muscle. All right. Masseter muscle is the muscle that is used for mastication. So when you're chewing your food and your, your lower jaw is going up and down and your teeth are uh, sort of clenching against each other. Masseter muscle is the muscle that is. So if you clench your teeth, the muscle that pops out at the angle of your jaw, that's your masseter muscle. All right. Um, so on the right side, just labeling them, number one is the frontalis muscle. Number two is the occipitalis muscle. Number three is the orbicularis oris. Number four is the masseter. Number five is the zygomaticus major. Number six is the um, orbicularis oris. Number six is supposed to be the orbicularis oris. It's uh, the tip of that line is not aligned. Uh, it is showing more the zygomaticus major. Uh, sorry, the zygomaticus. Um, so in this figure, number five actually is pointing to zygomaticus minor, but you don't have that option. So the, the lines are not very well aligned. Ideally, number five is zygomaticus minor and number six is zygomaticus major, but you don't have that option. You don't have the option of zygomaticus minor. Um, so in this figure, number six is supposed to be orbicularis oris, but it's not. All right, so I hope that confusion is resolved. And if you still have uh, questions, feel free to ask me. And number seven is your buccinator muscle. All right. Uh, figure 14.2D uh, shows you a deep view. So all the superficial muscles have been dissected and removed. And this is showing a deeper view. And as you can see, even the mandible is partially dissected to show the deeper muscles. Um, uh, the uh, fan-like uh, muscle above the ear over the temporal bone is known as the temporalis muscle. Um, and then you have these muscles used for um, in mastication while you're chewing your food, uh, also your pterygoid muscle. So when you're chewing your food, you're not only moving your jaw up and down, a major part of which is done by the masseter muscle, you're also moving your food from the right side to the left side. And that right to left movement of the jaw is carried out by the lateral uh, pterygoid muscle. All right. All right, so these are all the muscles required for chewing. So all of these muscles, right from orbicularis, um, uh, orbicularis oris, buccinator, medial and lateral pterygoid, uh, masseter, and temporalis, all of these muscles are used 
uh, while you know while you're eating your food because you have to elevate and um, um, depress the jaw so that up and down movements you have the lateral movement the holding the food in your mouth churning the food moving the food from the right side to the left side or even holding the food in the vestibule of the mouth these are the group of muscles that are involved so labeling them on the right side you have number eight that is your temporalis muscle number nine is the lateral pterygoid number 10 is the medial pterygoid number 11 is the um, orbicularis oris and number 12 is the buccinator muscle all right figure 14.2 c um, is a dissected view showing the superficial uh, layer of muscles after the platysma has been removed. So platysma is the superficial most layer muscle that has been removed. So the next uh, layer of muscles is exposed here. Starting from the top, you can see the um, occipital frontalis muscle. You can identify the occipitalis belly in the posterior part, the frontalis belly in the anterior part, and the epicranial eponeurosis connecting the two parts. The circular muscle around the eye is the orbicularis oris. The nasalis muscle can be a little tricky to identify in a dissected body. Um, zygomaticus minor is more medial. Zygomaticus major is the larger, a slightly more lateral muscle. Orbicularis oculi is the uh, or orbicularis oris is a circular muscle around the mouth. The vaccinator is slightly deeper to the masseter muscle. M masseter muscle is um, just below the um, parotid gland. So you can see the parotid gland right there um, is above the uh, masseter muscle. And then you have the big um, sternocleidomastoid muscle that uh, goes at an angle. Uh, it is running diagonally across. So when you turn your head uh, right to left, the muscle that sticks out of your neck, uh, that is the sternocleidomastoid muscle that is visible. Okay, and that helps in turning the head. One way to remember the movement of these muscles, number one, the name itself gives away uh, what the muscle is attached to or what the fibers are like. So that's one hint. Number two, if you know the insertion and origin of the muscle, in your mind, try to contract that muscle in, you know, in your imagination. And if you contract the muscle, see which end is moving. The distal end is going to move and come towards the proximal end. All right. Um, or even if you were just to make a movement and bring the two, uh, the insertion and the origin of the muscle closer together, what part would move? And that will quickly give you um, the movement that the muscle carries out. So you don't have to rote memorize it so much because trying to rote memorize all these movements can be very daunting if you don't understand how they are uh, named, what they are named. All right. Uh, the two new muscles we're seeing in this diagram would be the sternohyoid and the trapezius, and we will see them again uh, in a little bit. And we will talk about them in more depth when we get to that group of muscles. Uh, this figure 14.2D is giving you the deep view of the muscles where the superficial muscles have uh, been dissected. So the parotid gland has been removed, the masseter muscle has been removed. So here you're able to see the temporalis muscle, um, the lateral and medial pterygoid muscles. You're still able to see the orbicularis oris um, and you're, you're getting a better view at the buccinator muscle here. So here we come to figure 14.3a. This is showing the lateral view uh, of the superficial muscles of the neck. So now we're moving down to the muscles of the neck, the superficial muscles. We've already seen the platysma and the sternocleidomastoid. Now remember, sternocleidomastoid muscles, we have one on each side. Okay, if both the sternocleidomastoid muscles contract together, simultaneous contraction bilaterally will make the head flex. Um, as if you're saying um, yes, all right, bending, uh, bringing the chin down to the chest. However, if you only uh, bend, if only one sternocleidomastoid muscle were to flex or contract, that would then turn the head, all right? It would turn the head in the, uh, uh, as if you're saying no, all right? So make sure when you are asked a question about contraction of any group of muscles, uh, 
pay attention to whether they are contracting bilaterally, simultaneously, or just unilaterally, because that will change the movement the muscle carries on. So when both the sternocleidomastoids contract simultaneously, it flexes the head as if you're saying yes. It brings the head down. Um, and if they are contracting unilaterally, they flex the head sideways or they rotate the head um, as if you're saying no. All right, then you move on to the scalene muscles. And uh, there are three groups of scalene muscles, anterior, middle, and posterior scalene muscles. And the scalene muscles, um, bilateral contraction of the scalene muscles causes um, the first rib to move up in deep inspiration. And unilateral contraction um, flexes the head and rotates the head in the opposite direction, again, as if saying no. So scalene muscles would be synergistic to the sternocleidomastoid muscles when they contract unilaterally. All right. In this figure here, we are seeing just the middle scalene muscle. Okay. So you're able to identify the sternocleidomastoid muscle, the platysma, uh, the platysma, and um, the trapezius is that big muscle going from the back of the head to the neck. And we will see the trapezius again. This is one of the big muscles in the shoulder. When we do sh uh, surface anatomy, hopefully you have a little better view. Um, the muscle that we see going from the neck to the shoulder, um, which makes the shoulder line, if you will, that is your trapezius muscle. <clears throat> um, the levator scalene, um, uh, sorry, the levator scapulae muscle, and then you have the um, splenius capitis muscle. So the um, splenius capitis muscle, it is um, in the posterior part of the neck. It extends uh, the head when both the muscles contract. So that's, it's an extensor muscle. Um, uh, it laterally flexes and rotates the head on the same side uh, as the contracting muscle. Yeah, when only one side um, muscle contracts. All right, and the trapezius muscle, that is, uh, it extends the head and elevates the scapula. So on the right side, to label these muscles, number one is the splenius capitis, number two is the trapezius, number three is the sternocleidomastoid, number four is the levator scapulae, and number five is the platysma muscle. Uh, figure 14.3b is showing a uh, dissected um, body um, showing the lateral superficial view, and the platysma has been removed, so you're able to see the sternocleidomastoid muscle. Um, again, just going over, you can see the occipitofrontalis muscle, all the three parts of that, the orbicularis oris, so we've done most of this. I just want to focus on the muscles on the back of the neck, the splenius capitis, the sternocleidomastoid muscle, the trapezius, the levator scapulae uh, muscle, and the scalene muscles. Here we come to um, Figure 14.3c. This is showing the anterior superficial view of the uh, muscles of the neck with the platysma remove. Um, again, the first main uh, muscle of the neck is the sternocleidomastoid muscle that is going diagonally, diagonally across from the sternum in the midline to the mastoid process on either side of the head. All right, so that's your sternocleidomastoid. The other muscles that are involved um, with the movement of the neck, as you can see on top, you have the digastric muscle. It's called digastric because it's got two bellies, the anterior and the posterior belly of the muscle. Um, and the, um, the anterior belly elevates the hyoid bone and depresses the mandible, as in opening uh, the mouth, and the posterior belly elevates the hyoid muscle and depresses the mandible um, as an opening of the mouth. All right, and then you have the mylohyoid muscle. This is the deep muscle of the chin that uh, extends from the right side of the mandible to the left side of the mandible. 
um, and it elevates the hyoid bone and the floor of the oral cavity and it depresses the mandible. Then we move on to the uh, stylohyoid muscle. Uh, this is like the chin muscle. Um, it has a medial uh, to posterior belly. It is medial to the posterior belly of the digastric. It elevates the hyoid bone and moves it posteriorly. So you see all of these are attached to the hyoid bone. Remember the hyoid uh, bone is not does not articulate with any other bone. The hyoid bone is literally suspended in the neck by all of these different muscles. Moving on to the uh, sternohyoid muscle, uh, that runs along the midline in the anterior part of the neck and it depresses the hyoid bone. Um, and then same thing with the omohyoid muscle, it is lateral to the sternohyoid muscle and it also helps to depress the hyoid bone. All right, so just making sure we've labeled all the parts on the right side. Uh, number six is the digastric anterior belly. Number seven is the mylohyoid muscle. Number eight is the stylohyoid. Number nine is the posterior belly of the digastric muscle. Number 10 is the omohyoid. Number 11 is the sternocleidomastoid muscle. And number 12 is the uh, uh, sternohyoid muscle. Showing, uh, moving on to figure 14.3D, showing the deeper view um, of the muscles of the neck here. The sternocleidomastoid muscle has been di uh, uh, dissected away. The um, anterior belly of the digastric muscle has been dissected away. And the uh, sternohyoid and omohyoid muscles have also been dissected away. Can you see those dissected ends um, of those muscles? So here we're able to get a more clear view of the uh, mylohyoid muscle that lies deep to the um, anterior belly of the digastric muscle. And below the omohyoid and uh, sternohyoid muscle is the thyrohyoid muscle. Um, so here we're getting, and we're also getting a better view at the sternohyoid muscle. Um, All right, uh, and we're getting, so the thyrohyoid and the sternothyroid muscle lie below the uh, sternohyoid and omohyoid muscle. So make sure you don't confuse those um, names there. And then you have the cricothyroid muscles attached to the cricoid cartilage. All right, and then right at the bottom there, you see the scalene muscles of the neck. So on the right side, we just label them. Um, number 13 is the mylohyoid muscle. Number 14, ioscalene muscles. And number 15 is the levator scapulae. Uh, figure 14.3E shows uh, the deep muscles of the neck in a dissected cadaver. Um, and again, uh, we, we've gone through some of the muscles of the face, like the medial and lateral pterygoid. We will focus on the muscles of the neck. Um, we have the digastric belly here. You're able to see the posterior view of the digastric um, posteriorly. And if you trace it anteriorly, you're seeing the anterior belly of the digastric. Um, and the stylohyoid is sort of straddling between them. Um, below that, below the stylohyoid is the thyrohyoid muscle, and then you have your omohyoid muscle and the sternohyoid muscle. So see how they're all attached to the hyoid bone? Um, and the mylohyoid is seen um, posteriorly and deeper to the um, anterior belly of the digastric muscle. So now we move on to the muscles of the trunk and shoulder. 
This is figure 14.4 uh, showing the anterior view of the superficial layer of muscles of the trunk. Um, so the uh, pectoral region has the uh, pectoralis major and pectoralis minor muscle. Here you can see the pectoralis major muscle um, right in front. It's the biggest muscle on the front of the chest. Uh, and you can see the platysma muscle comes down from the neck superiorly. Um, the latissimus dorsi muscle, you can see a little bit of it. Most of this muscle is visible in the posterior view. So we'll see that, but a little insertion of it is also seen um, in the anterior view, and that sort of makes up the inferior border of your axilla, if you will. The serratus anterior muscle, as the name says, serratus. Serratus means sawtooth like um, you know your kitchen knife has a serrated edge and if you see the serratus muscle has that edge to it um, I'll show you with a maybe with a blue marker here you see the serrated edge of this muscle this is what gives it the serratus name the serratus anterior muscle what I would like you guys to do is spend some time going through table 14.3 on page 210 and identify not only the muscles but also the actions um, because say for example in the exam I will either give you a name of a muscle and ask you to um, identify the action of the muscle or vice versa tell you an action and what muscles are required for that action so I don't want to just read out the whole table here but I'd like you to spend some time um, being able to identify these muscles and um, understand how these muscles carry out the actions that they do and identify the muscle groups, which muscles um, are synergistic and which muscles are antagonistic, because those are, again, the kind of questions you're going to get to see in the exam. So not only just identifying the muscles where they are, but also their actions, their agonists, and their antagonists, all right? Um, uh, going down to the abdomen, right into the right in the center, you see the linea alba. Linea means line, alba means white. So that's the white line uh, down the center of the uh, abdomen. The external oblique muscle. Again, it's the superficial layer, and the muscle fibers are oblique. Um, therefore, it gets the name external oblique muscle. Um, again bilateral contraction this is the anterior surface so these are all your flexors so bilateral contraction of the muscle will flex the vertebral column and compresses the abdomen whereas unilateral contraction will flex the body laterally and rotate the vertebral column to the opposing side so if you contract the the left external oblique the you're going to turn to the right and vice versa if you contract the right external oblique your body's going to turn to the left all right that's your external oblique then the rectus sheath um, that is a sheath that is superficial in the abdominal wall um, and you have the inguinal ligament that is a ligament formed by the tendons of these muscles and the inguinal ring um, in females, the inguinal ring is empty, doesn't really carry any structures. In males, the inguinal ring carries the vas erectus, um, uh, the spermatic cord, and the artery and vein, and nerves supplying the testicles. And the inguinal ring, um, the inguinal canal has a superficial inguinal ring and a deep inguinal ring. And that is a point of weakness in the abdomen in males. Um, through which they can get an inguinal hernia. So men who have, a, say, obesity or um, a profession that requires them to carry weight or are otherwise body builders and lift a lot of weight um, for long periods of time, um, or patients who have chronic cough, they are vulnerable for inguinal hernia where the contents of the abdomen can uh, come out into the inguinal canal and sometimes can get strangulated there, uh, which is an acute condition requiring surgical intervention and correction. So that is the clinical implication of the inguinal canal. Um, so again, on the right side, you can label uh, these muscles. Number one will be the pectoralis major, number two is the serratus anterior, and number three is the oblique, external oblique muscle. 
And again, I'd like you to spend some time on table 14.3 on page 210 and uh, get yourself familiar with not just the names of the muscles, but also their actions. Um, the other thing I want to point out quickly here before I forget is uh, things like understanding the rotator cuff. Uh, the rotator cuff is a group of muscles that are deep and they are required to move the arm and they surround the shoulder joint. If you remember, the shoulder joint is a ball and socket joint, but the, uh, the glenoid fossa is a very shallow fossa. So the head of the uh, humerus is not as secure in the uh, glenoid fossa as compared to, say, the head of the femur in the acetabulum. The head of the femur fits into the acetabulum really snug and fit, um, and therefore dislocation is not that easy at the hip. But dislocation of the shoulder can be a lot easier and is more common, especially in athletes. The rotator cuff is what enforces the shoulder joint, and the muscles of the rotator cuff include uh, the subscapularis, supraspinatus, infraspinatus, and teres minor. So I need you to identify these muscles, and we will come to that again in the uh, figures to come, but I wanted to mention it here, um, so you keep that in your mind as we uh, read forward. Um, so we've moved on to figure 14.4b, showing the deep muscles on the anterior view. Uh, but one thing I did want to point out, which is labeled in this figure but not labeled in the previous figure and probably should be labeled there, is the deltoid muscle. Um, so just making sure uh, you are able to identify this muscle in the previous uh, figure. And that is the big shoulder muscle. Like on a, uh, if you look at anybody's shoulder, the shoulder, the, the curve of the shoulder from the surface is actually formed by the deltoid muscle, this muscle right here. In this figure, it's uh, dissected to expose the deep muscles, but in the previous figure, 14.4a, uh, it is really well seen. So I do need you to be able to identify the deltoid muscle in that figure. All right, so here uh, the pectoralis major muscle and the deltoid muscle has been resected to expose the deeper muscles of the um, chest. And um, same thing, the um, external oblique muscle has been dissected back to expose the deeper muscles of the abdomen. So we're uh, going from top to bottom. You're able to see the sternocleidomastoid muscle that is attached to the sternum and the clavicle. You see the trapezius muscle. We saw a little bit of it at the neck. This is the muscle that makes up most of the width of the shoulder. Um, and um, it helps in lifting the shoulder and or lifting the scapula. Um, then you have the pectoralis minor muscle that lies under the pectoralis major muscle and the subscapularis. Now remember, subscapularis is one of the muscles involved in the rotator cuff of the shoulder. All right. Um, be careful in uh, making sure you know how to identify the external intercostal and the internal intercostal muscles. The external intercostal muscles lie superficial or externally to the internal intercostal muscles. All right. The external intercostal muscles um, they help increase the thoracic diameter during respiration by elevating the ribs during inspiration. So if you can imagine like a bucket handle, the external intercostal muscles lift the ribs like the handle of a bucket and therefore increase the thoracic capacity or the thoracic volume during inspiration. The internal intercostal muscles lie underneath or internally um, under the in, uh, external intercostal muscles, and contraction of the internal intercostal muscle pulls the ribs back inwards um, and decreases the thoracic volume during expiration. All right, so make sure you're able to distinguish between the external and the internal intercostal muscles. However, during rest, uh, the most important muscle uh, that is required for respiration is actually the diaphragm. All right, that's the dome-shaped muscle. It is not visible here. Diaphragm is totally internally, and you can see that when you see like a transfer section through the um, bottom of the thorax or the top of the abdomen. The diaphragm um, divides the thorax from the abdomen, separates the abdominal contents from the thoracic contents, okay? 
um, and, and it has openings in it to allow the esophagus and the aorta and uh, the vena cava to pass through it. Um, coming to the muscles of the abdomen, the external oblique muscle has been resected away. Um, so the oblique muscle we're seeing here is the internal oblique muscle. And towards the uh, midline, we're seeing the rectus abdominis muscle. So see how the fibers are in different directions? The external oblique muscle fibers were coming in downwards and medially. The internal oblique muscle uh, fibers are almost perpendicular to the external oblique muscles. Um, and the rectus abdominis muscles are, are almost vertical. And then you have the transverse oblique. They've cut out a window in the internal oblique muscle to expose the transverse oblique. And as the name suggests, these muscle fibers run transversely. So uh, from exterior to interior, the layers of the muscles in the abdomen would be external oblique, internal oblique, um, and then the rectus abdominis and the transverse abdominis, all right? Um, and of course, all their functions are uh, depending on whether they're being contracted uh, bilaterally or unilaterally, the actions they carry out would be different. For example, uh, the rectus abdominis, uh, it flexes the uh, vertebral column and compresses the abdomen, um, but it does not cause any lateral uh, flexion. Uh, the external oblique we already talked about, it helps in flexing when it's contracted bilaterally, but unilateral fraction will help rotate. Same thing with the internal oblique, bilateral contraction helps to flex the vertebral col uh, column and compress the abdomen. So if you're coughing, you are exerting your external and internal oblique muscles. Um, unilateral contraction will laterally flex and rotate the vertebral column to the same side. All right, external oblique contraction will rotate it to the opposite side. Internal oblique contraction rotates it to the same side. So when it comes to flexing, the external oblique and internal oblique will be synergistic. However, when it comes to rotating, the external and the oblique muscles are um, antagonistic. And you will see this um, relationship with numerous muscles. And that, and that change uh, depends on the direction of the muscle fibers, all right? So be mindful of that. Uh, once you're able to identify the muscles and the direction of their fibers, it makes remembering their function a lot easier. All right, the uh, transverse abdominis uh, muscle, it again compresses the abdomen and it stabilizes the trunk. So the transverse abdominis actually runs transversely, so it is not involved in flexion. Uh, making sure we've named all these and to just to make sure we label all the parts number four is the pectoralis minor number five is the internal intercostal muscle number six is the external intercostal muscle number seven is the internal oblique number eight is the transverse abdominis and number nine is the rectus abdominis So here's the sort of a view of a cadaver dissected showing the superficial muscles in the anterior view. Um, and this is the muscle that I needed you guys to be able to identify in the um, in figure 14.4a. Uh, Make sure you're able to identify the deltoid muscle, right, this muscle. Um, and then you have the pectoralis major, which is the big muscle of the thorax. Uh, you have your trapezius muscle, that is the mus muscle of the shoulder, uh, you know, from the neck to the shoulder, the width of the shoulder. And then deltoid is the big curve of the shoulder. Um, the pector, uh, on the right side, the pectoralis major has been dissected to expose the deeper muscles, um, showing the pectoralis minor muscle and the serratus anterior muscle. You see how the serratus muscle is easy to identify because of this serrated edge that it has over here, like a kitchen knife. Then you have the external oblique um, and the rectus abdominis muscle. So if you were asked a question, say, you know, what's the six pack that you see in someone who is a bodybuilder? The six pack we see is the rectus abdominis muscle that is um, built up in these people. All right, so you can expect that like as a multiple choice question or a fill in the blank question. Uh, um, the, the six pack in the abdomen is caused by the rectus abdominis muscle. 
Um, here we have the anterolateral view of the abdomen, uh, giving a more uh, clear view of the serratus anterior muscle, uh, showing how the external oblique muscle fibers uh, go up um, in the anterior, anterolateral view and in the rectus abdominis muscle. Here is again another lateral internal um, anterior lateral view exposing the external oblique, uh, show, exposing the internal oblique muscle after removing the external oblique muscle. All right. And finally, this is again the anterior lateral view uh, where the external and internal oblique muscles have been re uh, removed to show the transverse abdominis muscle. So you see how gradually the direction um, of the fiber has changed between the internal oblique, the external oblique, and the um, transverse abdominis. So now we come on to the posterior view of the superficial muscles um, on the back. Um, so the, uh, from coming down from the neck, you can see posteriorly where the sternocleidomastoid muscle attaches to the mastoid process and the trapezius muscle comes down. You see how the fibers of the trapezius muscle almost are like fan-shaped. Um, attached to the scapula on one end and the vertebral column on the other end. And depending on which fibers um, are contracting, the actions uh, can change. So the trapezius, the name comes from a trapezoid. So are you able to appreciate the trapezoid shape of this muscle? It's kind of diamond-shaped muscles. Um, so it extends right from the skull to the vertebral column to the spine of the scapula and the lateral uh, part of the clavicle. So they ha it has a superior portion which elevates the scapula and extends the head. It has a middle portion that adducts the scapula and then it has the inferior portion that depresses the scapula. So the trapezius muscle alone can both do elevation of the scapula and depression of the scapula depending on which fibers are contracting. All right. And so when you look at a person uh, standing up, the, the width of the shoulder is occupied by the trapezius muscle. All right. Um, and the bulk of the, the round of the shoulder is the deltoid muscle. And that is the muscle in which most of uh, the intramuscular injections that are given in the upper arm, they are given into the fibers of the deltoid muscle. All right. Uh, the deltoid muscle is uh, the has posterior fibers. Uh, that extend and laterally rotate the arm. And then um, uh, the, the infraspinatus and the, uh, I need you to be watchful of all the muscles that make up the rotator cuff of the shoulder. So that is the infraspinatus and the teres minor muscles here. The interesting part, I wanted to spend some time again on table 14.4 knowing all the different actions of these muscles. So for example, if you look at this group of muscles, infraspinatus, teres major, and teres minor, um, all three of them, uh, well, let's see, infraspinatus and the teres minor will laterally rotate uh, the arm, all right? The infraspinatus also adducts the arm. Um, the teres major adducts the arm. Uh, and the teres major also adducts the arm. So when it comes to adduction, three of them are synergistic. However, infraspinatus and teres minor laterally rotate the arm, but the teres major medially rotates the arm. All right. Um, and in order to understand why they are um, having these different actions, it is important to know where their origin and their insertion is and again, the direction of the muscle fibers. Because um, um, the plane in which the joint moves uh, decides the uh, action of these muscles. So looking at this figure, it appears as if teres major and teres minor are right next to each other. The fibers seem to be more or less in the same direction, same as the infraspinatus, and you're wondering why does one do lateral rotation and the other does medial rotation. It's because the, the angle where the teres major then attaches is on the other side of the angle on which the rotation takes place um, compared to teres minor and infraspinatus. All right. Um, and I understand it can be a little tricky to do it um, without having a model in front of you to um, look at this. 
And then we have the latissimus dorsi. This is one of the large, uh, it's one of the main large flat muscles in the middle of the lower back. Um, it uh, extends, adducts, and medially rotates the arm. All right, if the arm is elevated over the head, it brings it down. So that's the big muscle in the back. And again, as you can see, it's got its fibers extending from a large area of the back. And then um, we saw a bit of the latissimus dorsi anteriorly in a figure. In figure 14.4, if you notice, we saw some fibers of the latissimus dorsi come anteriorly and get attached. So that shows you how uh, it helps in um, adduction and medial rotation. Um, the tendons of the latissimus dorsi form the thoracocolumina um, fascia. And then also we can see some of the fibers of the external oblique come posteriorly and attach. Um, making sure we've got all our parts labeled here. Number one is the deltoid muscle. Number two is the trapezius. Number three is the teres minor. Number four is the teres major. Number five is the infraspinatus. Number six is the latissimus dorsi. All right. This is figure 14.4 showing a, uh, the view of the deeper muscles of the back. Um, so here we are seeing uh, the splenius capitis, the levator scapuli, the rhomboid major, rhomboid minor, supraspinatus, infraspinatus, and teres minor. These three muscles are uh, part of the rotator cuff of the shoulder. Um, and then you have the teres major, um, and these are the deeper muscles. And again, instead of just reading out the tables that give you their actions, I would uh, like you to spend some time looking at these muscles, reading their actions, and seeing how these muscles do carry out these actions and sort of understanding it and memorizing that. Because, for example, I might just give you, you know, um, a movement that someone is doing or an image of some uh, person doing an action and then ask you what is the you know, the major muscle doing that. Um, and rotator cuff injuries are very common if there are injuries to these muscles. Um, for example, if a tendon tears off uh, for baseball players, bowlers, rotator cuff injuries are extremely common um, because the rotator cuff is weak and the head of the humerus literally slips out of the glenoid cavity and sort of hangs down. And when that happens, the anatomy is disrupted and the muscles are not able to carry on the actions that they're supposed to carry on because now the direction of the fibers has changed. Um, and, and for anyone who's experienced it, it's a, it's a frightening condition uh, that you're, you're trying to move your arm, but your arm's just hanging there, it won't move. Um, and the, one, the way to treat it, the muscle, the hand can literally be lifted and put back into position. Um, and, and the dislocation is reduced. People who tend to have it often can uh, relocate their own shoulder on their own, but um, in many cases, uh, it may have to be then surgically uh, reinforced and fixed, the rotator cuff. Some of the other injuries that are common in sports are like the head of a biceps could break or head of one of these muscles could break. Um, that causes, number one, where the broken muscle fibers tend to gather and contract. So there's a swelling in that area, it's painful. And then the movement gets limited because those fibers are no longer there to carry on the movement because they got detached from their site of attachment. Uh, so there's pain, uh, a swelling, and a limitation in movement due to these injuries to these fibers. Uh, make sure you spend a little time in knowing, you know, which are the agonistic muscles when it comes to ex extension and flexion, uh, and which are agonistic when it comes to abduction and adduction, because what could be agonistic in one action will be then antagonistic in another action. And I gave you an example of that um, when I talked about the infraspinatus teres major, teres minor earlier. Uh, but the same is true for, um, you know, a lot of the other muscles in their movement. So make sure you know 
the agonistic antagonistic muscle groups in all different actions you know flexion extension adduction abduction medial and lateral rotation etc uh, making sure we've covered all the parts labeled in this figure number seven is uh, the rhomboid minor number eight is the supraspinatus number nine is the infraspinatus number 10 is the teres minor number 11 is teres major and number 12 is the rhomboid um, major um, hmm. um, we come to figure 14.5 showing the uh, on the left side the superficial view and on the right side the deep view with the trapezius and the deltoid muscle removed in a cadaver what I'd like you to pay attention to over here and I will mark it uh, with the marker you see this triangle here formed by the latissimus dorsi inferiorly by the trapezius muscle uh, medially and the vertebral column of the scapula laterally remember this triangle this triangle is known as the triangle of auscultation and we will see it more clearly when we do the next exercise on surface anatomy um, and people who have well-developed muscles you know like bodybuilders and stuff this triangle is very well um, identified this triangle is important from clinical perspective because this is a thinnest layer on the chest and this is where a doctor would put their stethoscope to listen to the uh, lung sounds because in any other part of the back either because of multiple layers of muscle or because of the bone scapula being there the lung sounds can be more muffled um, so this is a little window where there's less muscle and tissue um, uh, sort of impeding the lung sounds coming out so that's that's why it's known as the triangle of auscultation auscultation is listening through the stethoscope so just remember that and we will revisit that when we do the next chapter all right again just making sure uh, you're able to identify these muscles you have the trapezius muscle on the shoulder up there it's, it's got its uh, upper fiber middle fibers and lower fibers and the deltoid muscle over the shoulder um, Make sure you're able to identify the infraspinatus, uh, teres major, teres minor, um, the latissimus dorsi muscle. Um, and on the right side, we see the deeper muscles, the levator scapulae, the rhomboid minor, uh, minor supraspinatus, infraspinatus, uh, teres minor, teres major, and the rhomboid major muscles. All right. Now we come to um, figure 14.5D. This is showing even uh, the deeper erector spinae muscles of the back. So here, the, the muscles that we just saw earlier in the previous image have also been resected and moved. So we've seen the deeper uh, layer of muscles. And these are the muscles that actually help maintain posture. Uh, they are the extensors. They help extend and maintain posture. So uh, the, the group, the, the, these are the deeper, the deepest group of muscles um, supporting the um, vertebral column. When these groups contract bilaterally at the same time, they help extend the vertebral column and maintain erect posture. However, when only one side contracts, it laterally flexes the vertebral column uh, towards that side. And it consists of groups of uh, iliocostalis muscle. So here you can see at the bottom, iliocostalis, as the name says, it starts at the ilium of the hip bone and goes up to the costal margins of the rib cages. Iliocostalis lumb uh, lumborum means in the lumbar area, the iliocostalis major uh, muscle in the lumbar area. All right. Um, then you have the longismus dorsi, uh, longismus thoracis. This is again the long muscle in the thoracic region. And then you have the spinalis thoracis. Uh, these are attached directly to the spinal column in the thoracic area. And superiorly, we have the iliocostalis cervices. Again, if you follow these fibers of the iliocostalis, this is the same muscle that is coming down down so it's from the ilium to you know to the costal muscles 
Uh, so in this area, it is getting attached over here to the costal to the costal fibers here, and here it comes and gets attached to the cervical vertebrae on top. So you see how it's all iliocostalis, but it's lumborum down here and it's cervices down here. Then you have the lungismus uh, services, the spinal services, lungismus services, same thing, um, just different fibers. These are all the groups, and they're basically just three groups, iliocostalis, lungismus, and spinalis groups. They're three groups of muscles um, with fibers. This is a model showing the deep erector muscles um, of the spine. Um, as you can see, the iliocostalis lumborum. And what I want you to appreciate is how the, the direction of the fibers is so well organized here. Uh, for example, if you look at the spinous capitalis starting on top here, it ends here. Um, and then the spinalis services starts here and then the spinalis thoracis takes on over here. And this is what allows us to do the rotation um, and maintenance of our posture. So these are very beautifully organized um, to allow us a very smooth movement of the back. All right, so with that, we come to the end of muscles of the uh, trunk. Here we start with muscles of the arm, all right? And we've sort of seen a couple of these already. So uh, this is figure 14.6a showing the anterior view, um, muscles of the arm and of the scapula. So uh, they're giving you a good view of inside the shoulder joint. The deltoid muscle has been cut off and we're seeing the biceps brachii. If you did your homework assignment at the beginning of this chapter, biceps means it has two heads. All right, so this is a muscle that has two heads. And if you're able to identify the two heads, here's one head and here's the other head that's going in here. All right, so that's your two heads of the biceps brachialis. Now, if you notice here, uh, the biceps brachialis comes down here and attaches to the forearm, all right? Down here, it is attached to the radius muscle. So when this muscle contracts, um, it um, flexes and supinates the forearm and it flexes the arm, all right? So uh, make sure you understand how it does uh, supination of the forearm because of its attachment down to the radius biceps brachia and then you have the brachialis muscle which also flexes the forearm so you have two muscles that are your flexors of the forearm all right um, now the biceps brachialis also flexes the arm because of where the muscles attach brachialic uh, uh, the brachialis muscle only flexes the forearm because the upper end is attached to the humerus Whereas biceps brachialis, because it crosses the shoulder joint, it acts on the shoulder joint too, and therefore flexes the arm and the forearm, all right? So biceps brachialis flexes the arm, and it also flexes the forearm, and it does um, supination of the forearm. Whereas the brachialis flexes the forearm, does not flex the arm. So you see how, again, they have certain actions that are synergistic, but some actions that are not. Um, on the right side, uh, number one is your um, biceps brachialis, and number two is your uh, brachialis muscle. Here we see the posterior view of the arm. These are now your antagonistic muscles or your extensor muscles, showing, showing the triceps brachii. Triceps means it has three heads. It's got the long head, the lateral head, and the medial head. All right, so that's your um, triceps. And on the right side, number three is triceps brachii, lateral head. Of Number four is the long head, and number five is the medial head of the triceps. Um, and uh, the, their actions, um, uh, all three heads, they extend the forearm and they help extend the arm. And again, because they uh, 
these fibers cross both the shoulder joint and the elbow joint, they have their action both at the arm and at the forearm. Um, they extend the forearm and extend the arm. We come to figure 14.6 showing a dissected cadaver image of the anterior view with the deltoid and the pectoralis major muscles have been removed. We're able to see the pectoralis minor muscle here, the biceps brachii, the two heads of the bicep. You can see a little bit of the triceps laterally, uh, the brachialis muscle. You're able to see a little bit of the latissimus dorsi coming in uh, from the posterior side anteriorly. And then we're able to see the top of the brachioradialis muscle. We'll get to that muscle in a, in a little bit. All right, so the brachioradialis muscle acts again on the forearm. Um, it flexes the forearm and it also pronates and supinates the forearm. So if you flex your elbow and then you uh, put a hand on the lateral aspect of your um, upper end of the forearm, and when you pronate and supinate that muscle that you feel under your arm, if you put your hand across your sort of elbow joint on a flexed elbow and then pronate and supinate your hand, that muscle, you'll be able to feel that muscle under your um, skin. That's your brachioradialis muscle. Um, this here is showing the anterior view of the right scapular muscles. This is again um, sort of the whole uh, the anterior part of the whole rib cage has been removed to show the um, anterior view of the scapular muscles. So you're able to see the subscapularis and the teres major. And look at how the teres major is attached here, which will help you understand the difference between medial and lateral rotation between teres major and teres minor muscles. All right. Um, and you're able to see the two heads of the biceps brachii, the triceps brachii, the brachioradialis muscle. Um, so this gives you a good um, view of the deeper structures in the shoulder joint. Here we have the posterior view of the uh, muscles of the arm and the scapula. We see the deltoid over the shoulder and the triceps brachii. Make sure you're able to identify like the three um, heads of the break of the triceps brachii here and here we have again the posterior view of the right scapular muscles where the superficial muscles have been removed so if you can see the supraspinatus muscle right on top there and then you have the infraspinatus muscle coming out from just under the spine and the teres minor muscle here so you see how the teres major is actually going in front and the teres minor is at the back and that's how they are different in which direction they rotate the shoulder. So you see how teres major and teres minor, they both cause extension and adduction of the arm, but the teres minor is the one that laterally rotates and the teres major medially rotates the arm. And that's the difference because of the way they are attached um, uh, distally changes. And we're able to see the three heads of the triceps really well over here, the, the lateral head, the long head, and the medial head. So now we come to the muscles of the uh, forearm. So first is the muscles of the anterior uh, forearm. Uh, we'll start at the top at the elbow joint. We see the triceps brachii and the biceps brachii insertions. Um, on top, which cause um, the biceps brachii cause flexion at the elbow, and triceps brachii are the extensors. Here, I'd like you to spend some time with table 14.6. Make sure you're able to identify all of these different muscles. Understand the name of the, you know, where the name of the muscle comes from. That will help you identify where the muscle is and what the muscle does. Again, in the anterior view, most of these muscles are flexors. In the posterior view, most of them are going to be extensors. Um, and as, as you can see, the belly of most of these muscles is um, on the proximal part of the forearm. And as we go towards the wrist, we pretty much have tendons of all of these muscles. 
So here we can see the extensor copy radial is longest, and we'll talk about the extensor copy radial is when we talk about the extensor compartment, which is more posteriorly. So you, you do see a little bit of the belly of that muscle here. Um, pay attention to the brachioradialis. Remember, we talked about it a little bit earlier. This is the muscle that if you flex your elbow and then you pronate and supinate your hand, you can feel that muscle at the lower end of your um, elbow. So that's the big belly of the brachioradialis that is felt near the elbow. But as it travels distally, um, it just has a long tendon, which is laterally. So be able to, uh, you know, trace these tendons down and see which ones are medial to lateral and see if you can identify them on your own hand. Um, flex these uh, muscles in your forearm and see if you're able to identify these tendons in your forearm. So we have uh, on the ulnar aspect, we have the tendon of the flexor carpi ulnaris. It is the uh, medial most tendon seen over here. Just lateral to that is the tendon of the palmaris longus. Now remember, all of these are flexors. So they flex um, uh, uh, the wrist joint, all right? So that's the tendons of the palmaris longus, and then you have the tendon of the flexor carpi radialis. So the radialis is lateral to both the palmaris longus and the um, flexor carpi ulnaris. And then the, uh, the brachioradialis tendon is lateral to even the tendon of the flexor carpi radialis. So that's how the tendons are located. And see if you can identify these tendons um, just proximal to the wrist. All right. So as I said, these are all flexors. The flexor copy radialis, because it is a little lateral, it also abducts the hand. Uh, flexor copy ulnaris is a flexor, but it also adducts the hand. Uh, flexor digitorum superior, um, superficialis, um, it flexes the hand and the proximal and middle phalanx of the finger, because the tendon of that one the minute the word digitorum is there, and I'm reading that from the table 14.6, uh, uh, the flexor digitorum superficialis is not marked in this figure. Um, we will see that when we get to the deeper muscles of the forearm. All right, so the flexor digitorum superficialis we will see in a little bit. Um, and um, Flexor. So, all right, so we covered these. These are mainly the flexors, and then depending on if they are medial, they'll be um, adductors, and if they're lateral, they'll be abductors. All right. This is just showing, um, again, a deep view. Here we can see the supinator muscle, and the supinator muscle supinates the forearm. Um, the flexor pollicius longus. Pollicius means to do with the thumb. So the pollicius longus muscle um, flexes the distal phalanx of the thumb. So that's what helps you flex the thumb. Those are the two muscles that are seen. Again, this is the anterior um, view, uh, uh, view of the forearm and the deeper muscles where the superficial muscles have been dissected off. Um, again, this is a model of the superficial view of the muscles in the anterior aspect of the um, forearm and wrist. <coughs> so here again, um, see if you're able to identify. I'll start superiorly with the biceps brachia and the brachialis muscle that come in from the arm and attach um, at the proximal part of the uh, forearm. And then you have the brachioradialis that also helps to flex the elbow, but it also helps to pronate and supinate the arm. Um, and then you have your um, uh, the flexor muscles, your flexor copy radialis, uh, which attaches um, uh, just medial to the brachioradialis but still lateral to the other two flexor muscles, which is the uh, flexor carpi ulnaris and the palmaris longus. And under these, if you can see, is the flexor digitorum superficialis. And, and, and below that, if you can see, is the flexor pollucius longus. 
All right, so these are all the flexor muscles. And what I want you to pay attention to here is the uh, flexor pollicis longus muscle because this is the long muscle that um, uh, flexes the distal phalanx of the thumb. And then you have the flexor pollicis brevis, means it is brief, it is small. It is a small muscle that also flexes the thumb. So these two will be synergistic muscles. And then you have the other flexors in the hand, like the flexor digiti minimi. Digiti minimi means the small digit, the pinky finger. And brevis means it is the smaller of the two muscles. So there's another flexi, flexor digiti minimi. It would be longer than this muscle. So these muscles, as you see, are right across the wrist. And their tendons go all the way down to, to the distal phalanx of the digit, which is how we're able to flex the three uh, phalanges um, of our uh, three phalangeal bones in our um, fingers. Um, the important thing that I want you to note here is that it's the same tendon that goes way up to the distal part of the phalanx. That means it's not possible for you to just flex um, um, when you when this muscle contracts, the entire um, phalanx, the the whole phalanx um, flexes. And if you notice, these tendons are sort of held uh, under little sheets. Are you able to appreciate these sheets over here? And there's a sheath, a reticular sheath, right here at the wrist too, um, which holds the structures in. And um, sometimes, depending on occupation, people who are at desks for a long period of time and uh, say are at the keyboard a lot, there's a lot of pressure on these bones. And this is what causes like a carpal tunnel syndrome is because the medial nerve that goes in through here uh, gets compressed on, in the reticular sheath. So the carpal tunnel is right here. Uh, and we'll see that in a little bit, I think, in one of the f uh, following diagrams. Um, just making sure we've uh, covered these muscles and labeled them. Uh, number one here is um, the pronator teres. Again, the pronator teres um, pronates, and it very weakly flexes um, the forearm, but it's primarily a pronator. Number two is the flexocopy radialis. And again, you can identify this by tracing the tendon. Okay, so trace the tendon down, and this tendon that's little um, is just medial to the brachioradialis, um, is your uh, flexocarpi radialis. Number three is the brachioradialis. Number four is the palmaris longus. Now, palmaris longus is the one that. Um, has its tendons going to th these digits here. All right, so the palmaris longus, um, it weakly flexes the wrist. Um, number five is the flexor copy ulnaris. So that's the medial most tendon on the wrist. Coming to the deep view of the anterior compartment of the forearm and wrist, uh, is the supinator muscle. Again, it does supinator. Flexa digitorum profundus. Um, so as the name suggests, it flexes the digits. So as you can see, it's got these multiple sort of tendon-like heads coming out, and they go down to the digits, and they help flex the digits. Flexa pollicis longus. This is the one that helps flex the thumb. And here is the carpal tunnel that I was telling you about. All right, it's got this sheath um, formed by the connective tissue there. Um, the dorsal interosci are muscles in between the uh, metacarpal muscles, uh, metacarpal bones. And the opponent's digiti minimi, um, it doesn't really help to do the op uh, opposition movement uh, like the thumb but a little bit of that movement, the inward movement. Um, making sure we are labeling these parts. Number six is the supinator muscle. Number seven is the flexa digitorum profundus. And number eight is the flexa pollicis longus. 
Moving to the extensor compartment or the posterior uh, muscles on the posterior part of the forearm and wrist. Again, they are the extensor compartments, so these are all the extensors of the muscle. Uh, see the extensor copy radialis longus. Um, it is uh, lateral and it extends and abducts the, uh, the hand. Uh, the extensor copy realis brevis is a slightly smaller muscle. It is an agonistic. It also extends and abducts the hand. Then comes the extensor digitorum. Um, it is the antagonist to the flexor digitorum. Um, it extends the um, hand. You have the extensor digiti minimi. Again, if you follow the tendon of that one, it goes down to the pinky finger. So it helps extend the um, fifth, fifth phalanx. Then comes the extensor copy ulnaris. Um, it is the medial most extensor muscle. We have the extensor pollicius brevis and the um, abductor pollicius longus. So the extensor muscle helps extend the thumb and the adductor pollicius longus helps to adduct the thumb. So the extensor pollicius longus, it extends the distal phalanx of the thumb the first metacarpal of the thumb and also abducts the hand. And the abductor pollicius longus, it abducts and extends the thumb at the carpal metacarpal joint and it abducts the hand at the wrist joint. So again, I'd like you to spend some time trying to identify these muscles, muscles in your own hand, do these different movements of your hand and see if you can feel these muscles. And if you spend some time sort of recognizing these muscles in your own hand and the different movements that will help you learn the names of these muscles and then be able to identify them in uh, figures and be able to label them. Uh, this is the deep view of the extensor compartment of the hand showing again the biceps brachialis and the tricep brachialis uh, superiorly, the, pro the pronator teres and the supinator muscle the adductor pollicius longus, the extensor pollicius brevis, and the extensor pollicius longus. And again, as these names suggest, extensor pollicius longus is the muscle that helps extend um, the distal phalanx of the thumb. All right. This is the model of the extensor compartment of the hand. Um, showing very neatly how all these muscles are located. Again, see there's an extensor retinaculum, kind of sort of uh, the mirror image of the carpal tunnel, but this time on the extensor compartment. Um, so right on top there, you can see the extensor copy radialis longus muscle. <coughs> <coughs> um, the extensor copy ulnaris muscle. The extensor copy radialis brevis. Um, and if you follow the tendons down, you'll see why, um, you know, once the ulnaris and once the radialis, the radialis is lateral and the ulnaris is medial, and the extensor digitorum is in between the two. Um, and the extensor digiti minimi um, goes down to the uh, fifth uh, phalanx. So on the right side, just labeling them, number uh, one is the extensor copy radialis longus, number two is the flexor copy ulnaris, number three is the extensor copy radialis brevis, number four is the extensor copy ulnaris. And I would encourage you to try to label this without looking at the figure on the left side. So in your books, if you can block out the figure on the left side and try to label these without looking, and then open it up and take a look and make sure you're correct. So number four was extensor copy ulnaris, number five is extensor digiti minimi, and number six is extensor digitorum. Coming to the deep uh, muscles in the extensor compartment with the superficial muscles being dissected off. Um, in this model, we see the supinator muscle, the adductor pollicius longus, the extensor pollicius longus, the extensor pollicius brevis. Um, you might want to look up what a trigger thumb is and what muscle is involved in a trigger thumb. 
and what is the treatment for a trigger thumb so that could be uh, a potential question in uh, in the exam um, all right so just a clinical application of um, the anatomy of these muscles and what happens so if you look carefully at the digits how these tendons are actually going through a sheath and that sheath is what aligns the tendon with the digit if the sheath is damaged or for whatever reason the sheath is not functioning properly the tendon actually slips off the bone and is not aligned very well and uh, and then the finger can be in a deformed position and the function of that muscle is not carried out. So if its job is to extend, it's not able to extend if it's not in that direction. Um, and then treatment for those conditions would be to align the tendon back into its normal anatomical position and then make sure it's anchored there in place so it's able to do its job. All right. Um, so number seven in this figure is the supinator muscle and number eight is the extensor pollicis longus. Again, um, try and look up what a trigger thumb is and what the treatment for that is. So with that, we come to the um, muscles of the thigh. So as you can tell, in the anterior compartment um, uh, will be mainly the flexors of the hip. Um, so right on top there we have the iliopsoas muscle which has two parts to it the psoas major and the iliacus muscle the both together they make the iliopsoas um, and it's big job uh, together they flex the thigh and they rotate the thigh laterally and they also flex the trunk and and depending on what they flex is what you choose to fixate so if you keep the legs straight and then contract these muscles the trunk flexes however if you keep the trunk straight and only flex the leg for example if you're sitting down the trunk remains vertical but then at the hip you're flexing so you see how um, you're, you're flexing at the hip but the position can change depending on which part which part is fixated and which part is moving all right um, they have the tensa fascia latte and if you notice it just has a belly the muscle has a belly superiorly but as you trace it down inferiorly it's uh, mainly just a tendon there and its job is to flex and abduct the thigh so as you can imagine the muscles that are here laterally will abduct the thigh and muscles that are medially will adduct the thigh and uh, depending on the direction of the um, fibers they may be involved in rotation as well uh, coming to the sartorius muscle as you notice that's unique it is a diagonal muscle um, that extends from the uh, anterior superior iliac spine and then goes down to the medial surface of the tibia and therefore it not only flexes uh, the leg and flexes um, it, it flexes abducts and laterally rotates the thigh all right um, uh, so for example this would be a leg that is allowed that allows us to flex and cross our legs and that is the sartorius muscle um, so the quadriceps of the muscles quad means four all right so the quadricep uh, femoris is the muscle that has uh, there are four muscles that make up that group the rectus femoris the vastus lateralis, vastus medialis, and vastus intermedius. These four muscles together make up your quadricep uh, femoris muscle group. All of them, they extend the leg. If you look at where the fibers of th these muscles go and they cross the knee joint, at the knee, they extend, they cause extension. All right? Uh, so they extend the leg. Then now coming to the medial aspect, like the gracialis muscle, the medial, medial most muscle, um, it adducts the thigh and it also medially rotates the thigh, but it helps flex the leg. 
because where it goes and inserts is a little more posteriorly and therefore it flexes um, the leg. Then the adductor magnus, uh, this as the name suggests, adducts uh, the thigh and it also medially rotates the thigh. Anterior portion flexes the thigh and the posterior portion extends the thigh. Um, and uh, so as you can tell, it's, it's got anterior and posterior portions because they are exactly aligned with where the uh, flexion and extension takes place. The adductor longus muscle, it adducts and flexes the thigh and also medially rotates the thigh. And then the pectineus muscle, which is medial to the eviosoas, it adducts the thigh and flexes the thigh. All right. Um, so here in on the right side, number one is the sartorius muscle. Number two is the um, rectus femoris. Number three is the tensor fascia lata. Number four is the vastus intermedius. Number five is the vastus medialis. Number six is the vastus lateralis. So this could be like one of the um, multiple choice questions to identify the four muscles uh, that make up the quadricep muscles. Uh, number six is the lateris, uh, vastus lateralis. Number seven is the iliacus. Uh, muscle number eight is the swas major. Number nine is the um, pectineus muscle. Number ten is the gracialis. Number eleven is the adductor longus. And number twelve is the adductor magnus. All right. Um, and again, I'd like you to you know spend some time doing these movements, like just pure flexion and extension of the thigh flexion and extension at the knee, uh, try adduction and abduction and identify all the muscles that are involved in that, then time medial and lateral rotation at the hip and identify all the muscles that are helping with those movements. So if you can isolate each movement and then make a list of the muscles that carry out that movement, that will help you know um, all the different actions that individual muscles do. So the book gives you the name of the muscle and all the different actions that muscle does. What you could do as an exercise is do an action of a joint at a joint and then name list the not muscles that are involved in that. So for example, extension at the hip, give a list of muscles that do extension at the uh, flexion at the hip. Uh, do extension at the hip, list of muscles that cause extension at the hip, adduction, and abduction, medial rotation, lateral rotation, and make a list of the muscles that are involved in these, and then see which group that will help you understand um, how individual muscles can cause flexion and medial rotation, or flexion and lateral rotation, etc. So you're able to reorganize it based on action that would really help you learn and understand this and that is something that would probably be there in the exam to make sure you understand how these muscles work coming to the deep view um, of these muscles where the superficial muscles are removed uh, we see the inguinal ligament right on top there uh, going from the pubic symphysis to the anterior um, iliac spine uh, and then you have the obturator externus muscle as you can see it's right outside the obturator foramen the gracialis muscle we saw that when we did the superficial muscles and below that you can see the adductor brevis the adductor magnus and the adductor longus muscles and again um, as the name suggests they are uh, they adduct the thigh and they also um, so the adductor longus will adduct and flex the thigh and medially rotate the thigh, whereas adductor magnus will adduct and medially rotate the thigh, but it has anterior portion that flexes and a posterior portion that extends the thigh. All right, the adductor magnus, you see down there how its muscle head, it, it, it has almost like anterior and posterior head. And because of that attachment of the head is why it's able to do these two uh, almost opposing antagonistic movements. Then you have the adductor brevis. 
uh, which adducts and flexes the thigh and also medially rotates it. All right. So number 13 here is adductor brevis, 14 is adductor magnus, and 15 is gracilis. Here we see a dissected cadaver with the uh, muscles of the anterior thigh, the superficial muscles. Um, I won't go over it in detail. We've covered all these in the model before, but uh, say if you get this in the exam, you'll be expected to be able to label all these uh, muscles and or the function they do. Um, and this is the superficial view with the rectus femoris cut off, showing you the vastus uh, intermedius lying under it. And here is again uh, the deep view of the, with the quadriceps removed, showing you the adductor longus um, and the adductor the adductor longus muscle also appears to be cut off here. There's the adductor magnus muscle showing you the two heads of the adductor magnus muscle. Um, and the other thing I'd like you to notice here is the tendon of the quadricep muscles. All the four muscles that make up the quadriceps of the thigh, the, the tendons come together and the patella is actually embedded within the tendon of these muscles over here. And at this bottom portion right here, this is where in a clinic, if you go, uh, the doctor will have you flex your knee and they hit the knee hammer right here on this tendon and you call that the knee jerk reflex. So this is where the knee jerk reflex is tested. At the tendon uh, of the uh, quadricep femoris muscles, just inferior to the patella. Um, here we now move on to the posterior view of the um, thigh. We see muscles of the buttock. The largest muscle of the buttock that gives the buttock its rounded appearance is the gluteus maximus. So it's the largest muscle. Uh, with that dissected, under that, on the right side you can see, is the gluteus medius and the gluteus minimus. All right. So the gluteus maximus uh, extends and laterally rotates the thigh. The gluteus medius all, um, uh, abducts and medially rotates the thigh. Um, and the gluteus minimus, which is below the gluteus, um, uh, it is deep to the gluteus medius muscle, it abducts and medially rotates the thigh. So I need you to, so they are a group, they are called gluteus maximus, medius, and minimus because they are one group of muscle, but you can see how their actions uh, can be different because of the uh, because of their attachments, their origin and insertion, because of the uh, direction of the muscle fibers. Then you have the piriformis uh, piriformis muscle. It's called piriformis because it's pear shaped. Are you able to appreciate that pear shape of that muscle? Um, this is a deep muscle inferior to the gluteus minimus. Um, and and um, this is an important landmark for the sciatic nerve, which passes deep to the piriform, uh, piriformis muscle. The function of this muscle, it laterally rotates and abducts the thigh. All right. Um, then comes your um, hamstring muscles. The hamstrings are the group of muscles that cause extension um, of the thigh. So the hamstrings are made up of the biceps femoris, semitendinous, and semimembranous. Those are the three muscles that make up your hamstrings. Like how we have the quadriceps anteriorly, we have the hamstrings posteriorly. They cause extension of the thigh and flexion of the leg. Remember the quadriceps did flexion of the thigh and extension of the leg. So hamstrings are antagonist to the quadriceps. Um, so here in this figure, they've marked inferior gemellus. How about you spend a little time and try to figure out what is the movement of this muscle? Like what movement does the contraction of this muscle cause? Um, and then you have the biceps femoris. Um, as you can tell from the name, this has two heads. 
just like how biceps brachialis we had in the upper limb that had uh, two heads. This is bicep femoris that has two heads. It's part of the hamstring muscle. So just make sure you spend time getting to know the names of these muscles, their actions, and then make a list of different actions at different joints and then uh, reorganize the muscle names and list the muscles involved with each of the action. And if you spend some time doing that exercise, it'll really help you remember these muscles well. And here's a model again showing the superficial view of the posterior um, muscles of the buttocks and the posterior thigh. The biggest muscle is the gluteus maximus. Just below that is the gluteus medius. The gluteus minimus is not visible in this um, figure. The medial most muscle is the gracialis. The lateral most muscle is your iliotibial tract. And then you have your semimembranous, semitendinous, and the biceps femoris, which make up your hamstrings. And this diamond-shaped um, um, gap here, this gap, this diamond-shaped gap here, that's your popliteal fossa, which is visible. So from surface anatomy, if you look at the back of somebody's knee, um, that diamond shape indentation that you see in the skin, that's the popliteal fossa. All right, and we will probably see it again when we do surface anatomy in the next exercise. All right, um, so one in this figure on the right side is gluteus maximus, number two is gluteus medius, number three is semitendinous, number four is semimembranous, number five is biceps femoris. Coming to the deep view where the superficial muscles have been cut, uh, we are able to see the gluteus minimus that lies deep to the gluteus maximus and medius. And again, I want you to spend some time. You see how these fibers are organized? Gluteus minimus, pyriformis, um, and, and the ones that are not labeled here but were labeled in figure 14.10 the superior geminis and the obturator internus. All right, you see how they sort of fan around there? I want you to spend some time knowing um, how their actions change and how they go from medial rotation to lateral rotation. All right, so for example, if you look at the piriformis muscle, um, piriformis muscle, does la it laterally rotates and abducts the thigh whereas the gluteus minimus abducts the thigh. So it is, it is um, an agonistic with piriformis because they both abduct the thigh. But the piriformis laterally rotates, whereas the gluteus medius medially rotates. So that tells you that that's the angle, the plane on which rotation is taking place. Right, so if you're able to appreciate that, um, you'll know the difference in the uh, movement of these muscles. And here they've also sh uh, shown the sciatic nerve. Um, and we did talk about that a minute before in the previous diagram, why th the position of the piriformis muscle is important because um, patients who have sciatica have feel this shooting pain down here. And hopefully you can also see how well the hip joint is protected by these muscles being attached to the hip bone on one end and then the greater trochanter of the femur at the other end, uh, which makes the hip joint such a secure and a strong joint to be able to carry uh, the weight of the body and do all the movements at the hip that we're able to do. On the right side, just making sure, number uh, six is the gluteus uh, minimus muscle and number seven is the piriformis muscle. Now we come on to the muscles of the leg and foot. This is figure 14.11 um, showing the anterior superficial view of the muscles. Uh, so let's just identify the muscles. The big thick muscle of the uh, leg that you can feel even from behind is the gastrocnemius muscle. All right, the, um, the muscle anteriorly just lateral to your shin um, again, in some in athletes and stuff, this muscle is pretty well developed and sort of bulges out anteriorly. That's your tibialis anterior muscle. Just lateral to that is the extensor digitorum longus. 
just lateral to that is the fib, uh, fibularis longus, also known as the peronesius longus. And uh, further lateral to that is the fibularis or the peronesius brevis. Brevis means it is a smaller muscle, but it's part of the same group. Um, again, uh, the, on the anterior aspect, we have the flexor muscles. So we have the flexor dig digitorum longus and the uh, tendon of the extensor hallucius longus. And this is the extensor because it extends the, um, the big toe. Um, soleus is the muscle just uh, below the gastrocnemius. So just going through the uh, actions of these muscles, the gastrocnemius um, causes plantar flexion of the foot, and it also flexes the leg. All right. Um, the tibialis anterior, it does dorsiflexion of the foot and inversion of the foot. The extensor digitorum longus, um, it dorsiflexes the foot and it extends the, uh, um, the toes. All right, so at the toe, when the toes, when you flex your toe is when your toes are bending downwards towards the ground. And when you lift your toes up off the ground, that's called extension. And that's why here your extensor hallucis longus is actually anteriorly and not posteriorly where your most of the extensors of the body are located. Okay, so that's um, because the movement at the toe, because the foot is flat on the ground in anatomical position, um, flexion is downward bending of the toes and extension would be when the toes are lifted up off the ground. And because of that change in that direction is why your extensor is now actually anteriorly. Otherwise, most of your muscles in the anterior are your flexors and your extensors are actually posteriorly in most other parts of the body. So just make sure you're mindful of that. All right. Um, on, so on the right side, number one is um, your extensor digitorum longus, and number two is your tibialis anterior, number three is the fibularis longus, number four is the gastrocnemius, number five is the soleus, number six is the flexor digitorum longus. Um, coming to the lateral view of the superficial muscles of the leg and foot. Um, so here you're able to appreciate the big bulk of the leg is by the gastrocnemius muscle. Just above that is the plantaris muscle. Um, and you can see uh, the soleus muscle is more clearly visible in the lateral view. So is the fibularis longus and the uh, extensor digitorum longus and the uh, tibialis anterior can be seen here too. So number seven here is the tibialis anterior, number eight is the extensor digitorum longus, number nine is the fibularis longus, number 10 is the soleus, and number 11 is the gastrocnemius. Um, make sure you go through these names of the muscles and their actions in the in table 14.8 um, and uh, make sure you know the muscles that are in the anterior compartment and the posterior compartment of the leg. So the tibialis anterior and the extensor digitorum are the muscles that make up the anterior compartment. Remember right in the beginning of the chapter we talked about how muscles are uh, said to be in compartments because they're surrounded by um, connective tissue of the fascia. That's important because sometimes injuries or infections can be restricted to a compartment. And so from a clinical point of view, that becomes very important. Uh, the posterior compartment of the leg includes the gastrocnemius muscle, the soleus muscle, uh, the flexor digitorum longus muscle. All right, so there are three muscles in the posterior compartment and two in the anterior compartment. So now moving on to the posterior view of the superficial muscles of the leg. Um, right on top, you can appreciate the diamond-shaped popliteal fossa. So, um, and, and this is the right leg. Um, 
So the big bulky muscle at the back, that's the gastrocnemius muscle. And you see how the tendon of the gastrocnemius comes down, and that's the big tendon felt at the back of the heel, also known as the Achilles tendon. And in a, the Greek mythology, uh, talking about the Achilles heel, that's the Achilles heel. So that's and it attaches to the calcaneal uh, muscle bone and the tarsal bone. Um, so most of the posterior view of the leg pretty much consists of the gastrocnemius muscle, but then on the side you can see a little bit of the fibularis longus, the flexor hallucis longus uh, can be seen. So number 12 here is your gastrocnemius muscle, and number 13 will be the soleus muscle. Now in this figure, they have not um, drawn the line for the soleus muscle, so I will try and do that here. So the soleus muscle should be here, and this one here. It's there in the book, but for some reason it's not there in this slide. All right, so that's the soleus muscle number 13. Um, this is showing the deeper view of the posterior uh, view of the leg with the gastrocnemius muscle being cut off. This shows the tibialis posterior muscle, the flexor digitorum longus, and the flexor hallucius longus. Again, as you can um, tell from the name, their job is to flex the uh, digits of the lower limb and the flexor hallucius longus causes flexion of the bigger toe, the greater toe, or the first digit. So 14 is the flexor hallucius longus and 15 is the flexor digitorum longus. And just be mindful that you know that the flexor digitorum longus, it plantar flexes the foot and then also flexes the toes. The flexor hallucius longus, it plantar flexes the foot and flexes the greater toe. So um, you could be asked questions like, um, if you're standing on your tippy toes, what muscle is contracting? All right, so think about that. If you stand on your tippy toe, what muscles are you using? What group of muscles are you using? So make a list of muscles um, that are helping you stand on your tippy toes. What movement is that? Uh, this is figure 14.11, again showing the dissected cadaver image of the anterior uh, view of the superficial muscles of the leg. We've gone over these. I won't spend too much time go, going over them again. Um, and here is a lateral view of the superficial muscles of the leg in a cadaver, dissected cadaver. Um, here's the posterior superficial view showing the gastrocnemius, the soleus, and the plantaris muscles. And finally, we have the uh, view of the deep muscles in the posterior aspect of the leg and the foot, showing the tibialis posterior, the flexor digitorum longus, and the flexor hallucius longus muscles. Um, this is figured from page uh, 234. Um, this would be a great exercise for you to try and label all of these without looking and then um, check to make sure you got them correct. I'm not going to give this to you as a homework assignment, but I would highly encourage you to do this one and the next one, uh, which shows the posterior view. So this is the anterior uh, view of the superficial skeletal muscles. And the next is the superficial skeletal muscles uh, showing the posterior view. And if you can label all of these, you're in good position for the exam. All right. So again, I would uh, encourage you to try to label this. I'm not going to give this to you as a homework assignment. I've already given you the homework assignment at the beginning of this lecture. Just do that, and that should be good. All right. And that is the end of this chapter. Again, I always encourage you to do the exercise at the back of the chapter because you may see this in your exam. So I would highly encourage you to do that. So that's the end of this. Thank you.
enough. 